Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and today I'm delighted to be joined by Patricia Morgan who is up in Cal Calgary in Alberta in Canada. How are you doing Patricia? <laughs> Cooler <laughs> than you, but I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Everybody's cooler than me. <laughs> Oh, you mean temperature-wise? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. <that too. laughs> um, so, um, you know, Patricia is a professional, uh, a professional speaker, and and talks a lot about uh, you know stress and how to manage manage stress. And you've also written books. Your latest one is from Woe to Wow: How Resilient Women Succeed at Work. You wrote a book with your daughter, an award-winning one called Love Her As She Is: Lessons from a Daughter Stolen by Addictions. And you have a number of other books as well. Uh, including Fant Frantic Free uh, and a number of other ones. And what we wanted to talk today about is this whole idea of stress, because it seems, I mean, it's not like stress hasn't always been there, but it seems like more people are talking about it, be maybe because of the global collective experience we all went through with with COVID and how that impacted people differently. Obviously, at the at the at the most extreme end, like people dying and losing people close to them. But just overall, I think people getting discombobulated, getting kind of knocked out of their rhythm, maybe coming home and working from home for the first time. Uh, and maybe some of the uh, trappings or accoutrements that they associated with their success or life were denied to them. So does, does stress has definitely become a, a, a much bigger issue. And I think, uh, Patricia, maybe it has started to manifest itself in, in different ways now that uh, it's become so prevalent. Right. Yeah. So st uh, stress is pressure put on us to adapt or change. And we have had more than our share of change during this pandemic. So every time we put out energy to shift, to adapt, to change our patterns, whether that's working at home or now we're asked to sometimes mm -hmm. work at home, sometimes go back to the workplace and other times completely go back to the workplace. So each time we are asked to make a change that takes extra energy because most of us are in a state of flow. You know, I get up, I don't even have to think about brushing my teeth. And throughout the day, I have my routines and our routines have been incredibly disrupted. So it is a time of disruption and, and disturbance to the flow in our lives. And many people aren't aware of that. And then these layers of stress add up. And when we think it's a happy change, we think that shouldn't affect us. I often think of the parents are going to have the newborn baby and they're so excited. I think, oh, you have no idea <laughs> of what's coming your way. Yes, it's a happy event, but it's incredibly stressful. Even getting married, incredibly stressful. So many changes and adaptations that we have to do and piling on our to-do list as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, I do. I, it's, really, it's funny you just mentioned that because I was, uh, remember be, you know, reading that you should, you know, you should, the stressors are, as you said, having a baby, getting married, moving house. I remember one stage we did all three pretty much in close <laughs> proximity to each other because we just thought, the heck, let's go for the full stress experience. <laughs> 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 moving jobs too, by the way, in, in that moving, mix. Oh my goodness. So yeah, that's, yeah. Quite, that's quite the layer. Yeah. 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 So, so Hans Selye, who um, coined the term eustress, talked about we need a certain amount of stretch and challenge, right? If we, if we just stay, you know, excuse the pun, limp and useless, uh, life becomes meaningless. And, we, mm -hmm. and, you know, people say, oh, you know, my job isn't very challenging anymore. It's too much routine. So they want some challenge. But if you take that challenge to too much, too much change, too much of a learning curve every single time. And, try, and during this pandemic, trying to understand um, the science, if you wanted to make an informed decision about whether you're gonna get the jab or whether you're going to negotiate uh, avoiding it, um, then uh, you know, add layers of conspiracy theories of trying to figure all of that out, layers and layers and layers of distress 
And many families also have discord about the information, which puts them in conflict. And conflict uh, is a whole nother piece of stress because um, we are hardwired for connection. Our prefrontal cortex needs to be intact so that we can make connection with one another. We have evolved, as Stephen Poor just points out in the polyvagal theory, we have evolved to create a sense of safety when we're in connection. And this horrid, horrid war in Ukraine, you see the people pleading for a connection to those people out in the world. But, you know, we've got we've got some dic a dictator and we've got other people in the world that aren't handling their power and control very well. And they are barking out in the world. And we don't know whether to fight back or whether to give up and flee and hide. That's really what's mm -hmm. happening in the world right now. And since the uh, Ukraine war broke out, I even noticed to myself, my nervous system getting a little a little edgy a little edgy yeah no, i i i agree with you just on a couple of things there because i mean i think the experience we went through uh, at the pandemic you're absolutely correct with it was probably the first time when we were not re as you said not really sure who to believe right and and then what we instinctively wanted to believe maybe was in conflict with our own personal values or whatever and and so yeah and then obviously you layer in a, 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 the, you know the war on top of that and you know the potential of nuclear war and all of that there's a lot of there's there's a lot of stress but I think that I think you're right. I think that COVID thing, there's probably a massive hangover of stress or stress being held in by people that hasn't been released yet. And that's the part I think that may be a little scary. Uh, well, the, the distress has uh, piled on people's nervous systems. And for many people, trauma has surfaced. And trauma is not stress. So I'd, I'd like to clarify the difference between having stress. So most of us have stress. I mean, to be alive and to function, there's yeah. some stress. It's when we crack, snap, or break that we're, we're in trouble, that we pull ourselves too far. So the nervous system can handle so much of uh, being hypervigilant to the dangers out there. So we have the pandemic now, you know, there's this war that's on the edge of affecting the whole world. And for many people, they have unresolved stressful events that happened that did not get calmed and collapsed. So what's the difference between somebody who is in a car accident going home from work, um, goes home, has a good cry, um, you know, my hubby, held me the last time I had a car accident, get the car fixed, and two or three days I'm back on the road. Yep. And somebody else who's in a car accident and for 10 years has refused to get in the car. That the difference is trauma because the whole nervous system did not get attended to and calmed. Mm. So we have people who are experiencing anxiety attacks, defensiveness, fighting, arguing, pointing, protesting, uh, and sometimes with the relatives, protesting, fighting back and forth, or and giving up collapsing and depression. And that's all comes from a nervous system that just can't stay centered, grounded, and in um, a con a, that connected state anymore. You just mm -hmm. can't be in an anxiety state or a depressed state and, and have a connection. Yeah, and, and that's fascinating uh, because I think every I think anybody, if you if you ask them for an honest answer, would you say we are more divided, angry, confrontational, conflicting, withdrawn, depressed, whatever? Throw all those things in than ever, and they, everybody would agree. So, how do people start? Because at the end of the day, we're all accountable for ourselves, right? So yes. how do how do how does one begin the process maybe of examining your stress, your reactions, all of that, and starting to, you know, mitigate them? Yes. Well, there's the old fashioned take 10 breaths. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's yeah. if you're moving into a very uh, charged defense fight uh, state. Um, and with depressed, you want to force yourself to pick up the phone and make human connection. Uh, you can start to program your brain uh, to 
some mantras that work for you. Mantras don't work unless they have some meaning for you. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple that I use. The serenity prayer has been used for decades by those people in AA and 12-step programs. Grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Another... Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I was just going to say on that is I think that is one of the most critical things right now is people either they don't know the difference or they don't care because it well, we, we live in a world where it's so easy to fire off, right? It's so easy to fire yes. off a text or an email or Instagram or Twitter or everything like that. And it's all about you want to be the first one to get in with it, right? So you don't really think through <laughs> what you're saying, right? All of this, stuff, all of this stuff. But if you're being really honest with yourself and stepping back is just saying you are making zero impact on any of these things. And particularly the other thing that I love is, I mean, has anybody ever had their mind changed by somebody shouting at them and telling them they're stupid? No, that just activates the, the fight or flee response. And you have a wonderful um, American, Marshall Rosenberg, who founded Nonviolent Communication. His books are amazing. I love watching his videos. By the way, he uses puppets uh, to talk about, we can't have a conversation to solve a problem unless our prefrontal cortex is on and intact. And when we are in fight mode or defend mode, we are in survival mode wanting to survive, wanting to feel safe. That's what the nervous system is, is doing to us. And we're not making a lot of um, logical, grounded, or connected uh, responses. So, so it was uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived the Holocaust, who mm -hmm. wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning, and talked about having an internal locus of control. And really assessing what you have control over is very, very helpful in a turbulent world. And to be centered in self, having this internal locus of control says, where do I have influence? And I believe that 95% of our influence is how we live in the world, how we speak, how we talk, how do we treat other people? Because other people are watching and particularly the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And then where do we have total control? We have total control, although it takes a lot of work over our thoughts, our beliefs, our words, and our behaviors. That's where we have 100% control. Influence, how you demonstrate the rest yeah. of it. Right. No, I, I, I totally agree. I think you model behavior. And if you think of who are the people that you look at and go, hmm, they seem to be very together. They seem to be quite happy. They seem to, un, you know, they seem to have got it all going on. Then you're more, you're more, you're more inclined to want to know more about that person. You don't want to know anything about the person up the street who shouts at you every time they pass because, <laughs> you know, you're wearing a mask, you're not wearing a mask, you vote this way, you don't vote that way, whatever. And you just go, yeah, you're like, you're going to change my mind by, you know, just being obnoxious. Right. So there's a difference between reacting and responding. Mm -hmm. So a stimulus happens in the world. And am I reacting, which is, again, a survival knee jerk reaction? Or am I responding from an intact prefrontal cortex that knows how to make connection, that knows, uh, evaluates, um, takes a look and assesses what is the best step, what is the best next word to say, uh, and how can I make a positive difference in the world? So if you were thinking about looking at your own pattern, take a look at, am I reacting or am I responding? And many people back to uh, the whole idea of trauma, there is an incredible population, probably, I'm just guessing here, so don't quote me, probably about 90% of people have some childhood, childhood trauma and youth trauma that surfaces when that stress bucket just gets too high. It's a drip, drip, drip of stress until the whole thing wants to explode. And we've got a lot of people exploding in the world. Oftentimes, very horrid things that are reported in the news about horrendous things that people did. And then it, then somebody comes on the police 
the head of the police department and says there's a mental health issue involved, right? We really, really, the best thing we can do for our world is look after our mental health, do some self-exploration and know how we can step back into a center grounded place or state that we can connect with others and problem solve in a calm and sensible, logical way. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree with you more. I think mental health is such a critical issue and it's ridiculous that we're in 2022 and it, there's still some stigma attached to it. It's like, you know, when you say to somebody like, oh, I broke my leg and they're like, oh, that's terrible. And they say, oh yeah, but you know, it's healing. How's the healing going and all of that? If you say to somebody, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of suffering from depression right now. I'm starting to see, you can see immediately, like I'm seeing a terrible, you can see immediately people go, oh, that's great. But they do it in a way that communicates that they're like, I have no idea how to deal with this. Therefore, I'm just going to ignore it because are you crazy? Are you, I mean, I don't know anymore. And I think that's the problem is like, people just don't know how to react to mental, uh, mental health issues. And because of that, people with mental health issues are reluctant to open up about them. That's right. Yeah, we have, we have, we have a culture that is not particularly comfortable with emotions. I can't tell you how many times people will say, if a president gets up and talks about mass shootings or some horrendous event and sheds a tear that we hear on the news, the president broke down. He didn't break down. Mm -hmm. He felt incredible passion and a tear came out of his eye. Right. Right. So, so how do we, how do we start to address this? Because I do think that it was there already, but I think COVID uh, accelerated a lot of mental health issues, not yes. just you know, adults, children, every. Um, but how, how do you start to, even as I said, let's go back to personal accountability. If it's me, like, how do I start my process of, of rebuilding, rejuvenating, reorienting my life? <laughs> I would start inside. Yeah. Uh, and that, that means not enough people are taking advantage of their mental health programs. They are there to support you. There's a program put in place and the technology understanding research in the area of psychology and healing modalities has really improved. We as therapists, I'm not only a professional speaker, I have a master's degree in clinical psychology and I have a client base and I'm doing that much more than speaking during COVID because the speaking engagements went mm. down and I decided to uh, revamp, re-improve, relaunch into studying my psychology, my uh, trauma healing techniques. I was using EM EMDR is one of the gold standards for healing trauma. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself and other people. The other uh, piece that you can do, and you can just Google uh, nervous system or and polyvagal theory and learn about the three states of the nervous system being centered and calm and steady or stepping into a charged state, which is where anger, anger and defensiveness live, or dipping down into the depressed state to, so that you can keep an eye on yourself. I've started to what I call map my client's nervous systems. Uh, I understand there's some people, particularly in America, that are calling themselves polyvagal coaches. Uh, I would recommend finding a psychologist or a certified therapeutic counselor who understands the nervous system or and EMDR so that you take the next step once you understand your nervous system a little better on, on how to heal those past traumas that have layered up in your system. Past distresses that equal trauma in your system. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. And I think that's a great piece of advice. And the only other thing I do, I wish, I wish that 
the healthcare industry that we evolved a little more to it's like i said earlier i mean when you when you're not feeling well you go to your doctor or you've got something mm-hmm. wrong with you or whatever uh, if it's if it turns out that it's it's a mental health issue yeah, send you off to a therapist and then it's kind of a completely separate track and i just don't the mind body connection is too is too strong for us to continue with that nonsense Good for you for knowing that. Years years ago, you went to the massage therapist to attend to your body, and then something would pop up that was mental, and then you would go to the therapist to talk about it. And then you start talking to the therapist, the first thing you know, you'd have something going on in your body. Uh, people that are trained in EMDR and trauma-informed therapy uh, combine both. It's called uh, top-down and bottom-up yeah. therapy. So we're getting, we're getting, we're improving. On that. No, no, so we no, we definitely are, definitely are improving. <laughs> well, you know, um, and it's a, I mean, it's like I go to I go to an acupuncturist um, uh-huh. sometimes, a, a great guy, Korean doctor, fantastic, but he just doesn't stick needles in you. You know, he checks your, <laughs> you know, he does all this pulse work and work, yes. and then he he then looks at you know where you come from, your diet. He goes to have so many different things, patterns, breathing, even all of that kind of stuff. Yep. And I just feel that that's where we need to be is more comprehensive. And I think think you know uh, general practitioners or something need to start to adopt that more, um, as I said, comprehensive approach and form uh, partnerships and whatever with other types of providers so that you can have right. a good comprehensive. It's not just the the doctor and the you know the consultant therapy the consultant orthopedic doctor well we've got a great partnership no but where's the, where are the other people right well right now it's really important that we take charge of what we need and mm-hmm. maneuver our way to get it because the health system the traditional health system typically is not there yet uh, i love the quotation by the philosopher hillel if I am not for me, who will be? Yeah. And it goes yeah. on to second part. If I'm only for me, what is the point? Yeah, so yeah, having, having a purpose, a reason to get up in the morning really helps me. I'm a 75-year-old seniorpreneur, and I'm still going strong because I get up in the morning and I say I can make a positive difference. And it really gratifies me each day to be able to do something, whether it's an interview with someone like you, John, or whether it's to serve one of my clients. Well, that's fantastic. Well, um, regardless, you are a first on here because you're the first person to bring puppets on this. And uh, <laughs> I would thank you for that. I love first. <laughs> Oh, well, this is, this is Mr. Pooch and this is Miss Puss. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and sometimes they connect and sometimes they annoy one another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit like my animals here. Yeah, my dog and the two cats, yeah. Um, but I always love because, you know, cats are very good at ending arguments. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they leave. And that is, that is a good strategy for human beings, as long as you say when you will be back, because yeah. the disconnection can be terrifying for some people who were abandoned as children. Just know that for many people, somebody walking out the door angry and they don't know that person's going to come back is absolute torture. So it's yeah. fine to go out the door. That's a good idea to cool off and say when you're going to come back. Yeah, their other tactic, of course, is the swift right or left hook, but that's a <laughs> that's a di- that's a different approach. <laughs> all right, well, listen, Patricia, this has been fantastic. Like all of Patricia's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. A little bit more about who I am about, and what I- yeah, and what what you do, yeah. Well, I I have a therapeutic counseling practice and help people with trauma, particularly childhood trauma, and I deliver presentations on the topic of resilience, which in, includes getting ourselves back on track on living our best life. And my, my books are on my website. My website is Solutions for Resilience. And on there are over uh, 250 blog articles on some of the topics we've discussed and my books that are for sale are also there and a description of my therapeutic practice and some of my presentations for the public. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again. And yeah, I think that's just a, a final note is, yeah, if 
resilience shouldn't mean that you are just really, really good at suffering <laughs> and that you're really good at just suffering all the time. That's not resilience um, at, the, at the end of the day. So um, as you said, start working yourself, de-stress, uh, start looking at the things that are really impacting you and, and try and try and model, you know, if there's one message, you know, just try and be the best version of yourself and model behavior. Stop trying to tell other people what to do. Maybe <laughs> work a little bit more on yourself. <laughs> when I know better, I do better. That's from Maya Angelo. And resilience is actually the tools and capacity to face and deal with challenges, adversity, and setbacks. Yeah, yeah. Face and deal with, not just not just, yes, the not just consume. <laughs> right. The tools and the capacities. There's a reason that there is a billion dollar business in self help books. <laughs> yeah, for sure <laughs> alright well listen thanks again Patricia thank you all for watching and listening and I'll see you all for another interview really soon